I'm George Nordhaus and welcome to Monday morning. This is a somewhat different procedure than we've had normally. I always say that every week, don't I? But this is particularly one. Because we're going to be talking about succession planning and doing it on your own terms. And it's not just the subject so much, but it's what we're going to be doing. It's talking about selling the agency eventually and who can buy it and what can buy it and what, you know, all of the details on it. And the interesting thing about it is that uh, it is a really uh, big subject here. And it has some of the most uh, beautiful uh, information in it or uh, well-researched information in it I've ever seen. So uh, let me tell you, uh, Rick, um, Dr uh, let's change the slide and let me show you this guy here. He is going to be the presenter, and he is something else, man. He has founded this organization. I've, this is the only one I've ever heard of, really, that does what they do in our industry. There may be a few more, but they've done a beautiful job. Rick, tell us about your background, will you? Yeah, thank you, George. And first, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here on, the, uh, on your Monday morning series. My background, George, is in public accounting. Uh, it started with Deloitte, and I saw your last presenter was from the Deloitte uh, team as well. So my background is public accounting. I'm a CPA and uh, was focused on manufacturing and then financial services for about 10 years in public accounting before uh, moving over to a venture capital firm and then uh, was the founder and uh, started Oak Street Funding in 2003. Boy, I tell you what, that background is amazing. And I, 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 I just didn't even realize that you were teaching at Indiana University, too. That's great. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, I'm impressed, to say the least. And, and you know, the thing that got me the other day, and I see it's in your thing, is you've you had 2,000-plus uh, businesses with loans. That's an amazing number. That is really yeah. We, you know, we've been real fortunate. We've gone through starts and stops, George, uh, with different ownerships, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the uh, later in the uh, presentation on our current private equity ownership. But we've had starts and stops. We've, you know, feel good about uh, what we've been able to accomplish in ten years with helping out, you know, over two thousand agents and and close to a half a billion dollars in capital being provided to the insurance industry. That's a lot. Uh, of you know, to date, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'm uh, very impressed. With what, you, when we first started talking about doing this, I, and you said, well, look, these are the things that I can talk about here. I, I, said, I, I said to you, uh, Rick, you know, we're trying to keep these at 20 minutes or something like that. And then I began to realize that you have such good information here and that we are archiving that information and that uh, to cut this shorter would be a, a, wouldn't be a good thing for our members or people who are listening to it. And this goes out to about 20,000 people. So uh, I've asked you, if you would uh, be so kind as to uh, go ahead and give us all this information, and then we'll have it in the in the archives, and people will be able to go into it forever because it's going to be a great research tool. If it gets out of if it gets out of uh, uh, date, uh, Rick, you got to come back and do some more. How's that? But uh, that sounds great. Uh, now, and you, as we talked, George, when we put this together, there is a lot of material. You know, I'm not going to go through slide by slide and point by point on it. Uh, it is all available on our on our website and uh, you know through the newsletters and white papers that we have there that people can sign up for. So, That's perfect. Um, but there's a lot of material. I'll try to limit it to uh, 15 minutes. All right, who's the agency these days that we're talking to? What's typical? Yeah, you know, today what I'm going to focus on, George, is uh, really four topics. Uh, first is kind of the agency demographics that are out there. Uh, second are, you know, the uh, mergers and acquisitions, kind of trends and options. And then there's a, a couple of things, you know, one inside of insurance will be a little bit of uh, a focus, but also just, you know, the M&A trends that exist out there uh, amongst all the industries. All right. Um, the next thing that I'll focus on is the advantages and disadvantages of selling externally and internally. And we have a, uh, a real-life case uh, study that we've included here of a, of a deal uh, that was done a few years ago. Uh, I'm not going to go through the specifics of it, but, you know, it's there for reference. And then last, uh, I'm going to focus on what are the considerations needed, uh, you know, when you're preparing to sell? What things should you be thinking about? Um, and that will be the last topic I discuss. All right. Let's move forward. You got it. You know, from an agency profile, uh, agency principals are uh, between typically between 50 and 80 years old. 
Uh, there's a lot of times, you know, in the transactions we're working on, you know, children or key employees that have been active in the agency for many, many years. Uh, and there's a desire to provide the employees with opportunities and, uh, you know, to build wealth for themselves. Uh, the, the commission stream, as, you know, the people on the line know, is a, is a pretty predictable stream here uh, with not a lot of risk. Uh, and so uh, in a lot of agencies, there's a, a desire to create liquidity. So, you know, the decision really gets thrown back of, you know, what does the agency owner want to do? Um, and, and that's a key consideration that they've, they've got to think about. Uh, what are they trying to accomplish in a transaction, either from a succession or a sale? Are they trying to gain cash? Are they trying to build a legacy? Uh, and I would say, you know, with just those two things, that's 80% of the time what they, those two categories, what they'll fall into is it's, it's I want to maximize cash or I want to, you know, really I've built an agency and I want it to continue and to perpetuate itself and to have a legacy. So, you know, a couple of statistics here that were pretty interesting to me, and, and some of this came out of some studies I've read out of UBS recently on M&A, but 53% of business owners plan to exit uh, their business in the next 10 years. Now, ironically, even though 53% want to exit, 90% of them, George, do not have a plan in place. I bet that's So true. they all know it's going to happen, but 90% have done nothing. But everybody's going to have to someday. I mean, they might might as well know that. I mean, we're all going to sell someday, aren't we? Absolutely. So, uh, and most people don't want to run a business for the rest of their life either. <laughs> um, in the insurance industry specific, 70% of agency owners are 57 years of age and older, with an average age being 51. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some young people coming into the uh, uh, into the industry, but I think with technology and with some of the direct writers that are coming in, you know, that's how those numbers uh, shake out. There's 2.3 million workers in the insurance industry, and a million plus workers uh, will reach retirement age in the next 10 years. So, you know, when you think about it as an agency owner, you got two choices. Um, you can either do do nothing, <laughs> or uh, you know, kind of do something there. Um, you know, on, on the do something, uh, you can plan to sell externally, you could plan to sell internally, uh, or just do some estate planning. You know, and part of that estate planning, one of the things, you know, that is not in this presentation, but it's something to consider uh, if you don't plan to sell is what's called a dividend recap. Uh, your attorneys and advisors will have more information, but in essence, it's the company borrows money and it just gets dividended out to the owners and there's no change in ownership. Um, a couple of statistics more from a, from a UBS study is that, you know, uh, number one, 14% of business owners plan to pass on their ownership to their family. Just 14%. George. It used to be higher, didn't it? I, I would, it, that's exactly my thought as I went through this, is just anecdotally you would have thought that, you know, in probably 50 years ago, I'll bet that number was closer to 50%. But number two, 20% plan to sell their business to an employee, which leaves the, re the rest, you know, 60 to 65% plan to sell to a third party. So some pretty interesting numbers there. Yeah. Uh, you know, today uh, it is absolutely a seller's market. There's a lot of private equity money out there chasing deals, and the banking and the leverage worlds are also pretty frothy, meaning that they can provide, you know, capital to help facilitate these transactions. You know, the result of all this is that you can maximize the value uh, of your business through an orderly liquidation and a conscious decision. If you plan to do nothing, um, you know, maintain control indefinitely. You don't put a plan in place. Uh, you, the, li the, the business liquidation it goes through wealth transfer, uh, or you potentially die in the chair is the, is the <laughs> nice little picture that we have up. You got my picture in there, um, yeah, you know, a couple of real life examples of doing nothing uh, that everybody will probably be able to remember, recall, or relate to, and that's, you know, in sports. Uh, if you think about uh, sporting teams and how the valuation of those businesses has grown just dramatically, um, you know, you better have capital in place to be able to uh, facilitate that change versus just going to an estate. If you think about the Miami Dolphins, you know, with Joe Robbie owning it and the family had to liquidate, uh, 
you know, the ownership of the Miami Dolphins because they couldn't afford the estate tax. And I think similar things occurred with the Redskins and the Detroit Pistons. You know, those are real-life examples of you've got a legacy business that you want to perpetuate, as I'm sure they did, but they never put a plan in place. And, you know, the family cannot uh, uh, swallow the tax burden that's going to exist due to the valuation increases. So um, there's, uh, there's, there's real problems and real risks to the employees, uh, of a business in, in insurance to the carrier markets and to sub-producers if you choose to do nothing. Um, if you plan to do something, you know, we, we've got the slide up that shows from an external basis. Uh, you can sell to an aggregator, and we'll go through kind of the, uh, the some of the pros and cons of doing that. Uh, sell into a private equity shop sell into a carrier, sell into a competitor. If you choose to sell it internally, you could sell it through an ESOP and sell through a, uh, a, management, a management recapitalization. Uh, so we're going to go through, uh, we have a slide for each one of those. You know, I haven't, uh, I haven't I, excuse me, I haven't heard of ESOP. I know, I know ESOP very well and how they work. Nearly, but you don't see that very much. Are you seeing it a lot? You know, we've seen a couple of those deals, and for a while, George, we uh, we didn't dive into those. They're obviously a more complex transaction, mm -hmm. um, but we have funded uh, several ESOPs to date. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what I really like about them is the alignment that it creates. That you know, it's the employees that are going to retain and own the business, and they're the ones that have the relationships with the customers. So. Uh, here at Oak Street, we do like funding to ESOPs okay, uh, good. because of the alignment. I always thought they were great. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, selling externally. Selling externally. You know, the first one we have there is a is a aggregator sale. You know, and what we're thinking about there is you know uh, like to a Brown and Brown, to a Gallagher, to Assured Partners, Compi Seguros. Um, you know, those are private equity backed or public companies that are really trying to accumulate properties and you know there's benefits and drawbacks to doing these types of transactions uh, a couple that I want to highlight um, it could give you uh, it, the, the purpose of these things is to create efficiencies in the synergies so that's going to be a lot of the focus and the upside you know to the buyer they have a lot of liquidity right now uh, and they can give you very quick quickly uh, greater access to markets and they're going to give you a good valuation. Um, they have a very good understanding of the insurance industry. They're more tolerant of different market cycles as you know it's going to be consistent throughout their business model. You use the, word, draw, you use the word aggregator. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, to, to a lot of the agents and aggregators like a cluster or like Renaissance or Keystone or some of those places that sure. Uh, what's the difference yeah, between that's your not to be yeah a little bit different here because the aggregators I'm referring to, George, and, and that's a great point, are, are buyers in the market. Okay. Where right. when you're working with a cluster like the the, the great ones that you mentioned, um, you know those guys are helping more on a co-op type concept versus you know a potential buyer. Right. But right. I'm sure in some cases that's occurred as well. Mm -hmm. You know, from a drawback perspective on an aggregator, um, you're going to lose some autonomy. Uh, there's going to be profit and uh, growth expectations. You know, with the with the top price and dollar that they're giving you, um, just like anybody else, they're going to want to want to return. Uh, from a turnover perspective, um, you know, it's going to be something you're going to need to be aware of, especially if you, as the owner, are no longer in the seat and at the helm. That some of your uh, staff that have worked for you for several years may not like the new culture uh, that's going to be set. So. Um, you need to think through some of those things. Right. On a on a private equity sale, again, there's a lot of uh, liquidity in the market. But one thing to keep in mind uh, on a private equity uh, sale is that's a financial transaction. It's a financial buy. Typically, a strategic buyer will provide a greater uh, valuation and a greater multiple that you could uh, if you're trying to maximize cash. Um, but in today's market, with the amount of private equity dollars out there, uh, these these numbers are starting to converge a little bit, George, and uh, getting closer and closer. A lot of the same benefits and drawbacks that you saw on the aggregator side with liquidity, taxes, growth, um, 
the one thing on a private equity model that you're going to typically see is that private equity guys are going to look for a structure on a deal where the, you know, because they're going to provide all the capital up front, is they're going to look for a preferred return on the back end. So, you know, for you to continue to make uh, money beyond just a, uh, you know, a straight salary, you're going to have to outrun the preferred return <laughs> that they're looking for to truly get an upside on the growth you're providing. You know, when you talk um, about private equity, are you talking about like VCs or investment firms or Sure, yeah, in private equity, I mean, there are specific private equity shops out there. You could say a VC, um, you know, Oak Street is owned by a private equity shop, uh, just a fabulous company based out of New York City called Angelo Gordon, mm -hmm. which is a, a $26 billion private equity uh, <laughs> shop, and they've got various investments. Wow. Uh, finance company is one of their specialties. And, you know, as you talk about, you know, on the drawbacks, with lost autonomy, growth and expectations, and even down at the bottom bullet uh, with business understandings. You really have to focus when you're selling to a private equity shop and make sure that you've got alignment with the buyer, you know, with that private equity shop and the board that's going to be put together relative to, you know, your plan for growth and your strategy, that your cultures are going to align. And uh, because the last thing you want to do is, you know, partner with a private equity shop that's going to have unreasonable expectations, not know your industry, and uh, you know they're going to they're going to turn you out of there, and not even give you an opportunity to be mm -hmm. successful. So make sure you're well aligned. I mean, that's that's really the gut check that you have if you're doing a private equity sale. Okay. If you're doing a uh, you know a carrier sale, I'm not. Yeah, a lot of the benefits and the drawbacks are the same. What I would say here is. We don't see as many of these, uh, George, um, so I'm not going to spend as much time here. Typically, a carrier is going to do a, uh, an acquisition of, a, of an agency as more of a defensible position uh, in order to keep the distribution you know, of the agency or to be able to, you know, it's a strong distribution and they want to push multiple products through there. But the benefits and the drawbacks are uh, are pretty consistent. I don't see that anymore. I I don't I can't remember a carrier sale buying an agency. I know you can because you see it all the time. But I hardly ever. Yeah, what I what we see is really is a, a carrier sale did occur, and maybe it's being pushed out now because it didn't work so well. So okay. what we see is the you know. Um, more down the line from those where they're being pushed out from the carrier at this point in time and the management team is buying them, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, competitor sale, um, you're going to see some sometimes, uh, you know, uh, in the market, a lot of the same benefits and drawbacks. Um, one of the things there I would really focus on is on the drawback side is uh, bullets two and three is uh, making sure that the culture is aligned and that you're going to be able to keep your employees and you know really with any one of these things you know as I'm going to talk about later uh, from a valuation perspective is these businesses are really about people so um, you know being able to maintain your staff is going to be critical to uh, the growth of the business mm -hmm. on an internal sale I'll give you one more uh, tidbit of information that came from uh, it's another UBS uh, statistic here is that in specifically related to an internal sale is that 70 percent of the children who inherit more than a million dollars lose it within a three-year period <laughs> wow. which was just astounding to me George <laughs> you know you would think that these uh, they would come from good backgrounds and saw what their fathers or grandfathers has created and want to, you know, uh, retain it and, you know, build upon it, but 70% uh, of them uh, lose that million dollars within a three-year period. Wow. Um, the next slide is, uh, you know, what is an internal succession here? And that's really transferring to family and key employees. You know, we've got a couple examples here. Um, uh, that we talked about, but uh, the, the key component to this, to me, is really the third bullet down. And that's, you know, a business that's going to be sold to a family or a key employee, that transaction and the transition there from a father to a son or father to a daughter um, or to the employees, maybe it's a, you know, a majority owner that's selling out to the, to the remaining workforce, they're typically a little bit easier 
uh, to document up legally the reps and warranties that are going to be required because the people are already operating the business. So that's a, a key differentiator when you're selling internally versus externally. What we have on the next slide here is a real life example and it's a product that Oak Street put together and we developed about five years ago. And what it's basically doing is taking you know, 100% owner in this example, George, and you go through this recapitalization where, you know, the uh, the company will borrow funds and and, and repurchase 30, 34% in this example. So the, the, the third row down, they're going to repurchase 34% of the ownership uh, and then redistribute that out. So the 100% owner would then have 66 remaining. So maybe in the second year, they're going to buy another 33% of the business, and there'll be 34% remaining in year two. And then in the third year, um, you know, the seller is going to relinquish all the remaining shares, and all the shares then will transition and be reallocated to the existing ownership. That sounds neat. You know, that's called a more, you know a recapitalization of the ownership, and and it's really kind of a nice structure because, you know, the the seller can kind of slowly Mm -hmm. transition out of the business. You can do this over, you know, a three-year period. You could do it over two. You could do it over five, you know, at 20% a year. So there's all different types of time frames that can occur, uh, and it really allows them to, you know, come to the decision that, you know what, hey, I'm not going to sell and just go cold turkey on this. I like the people. I want to make sure it's going to transition successfully. There's going to be a legacy, but it's kind of a nice structure uh, in which both parties can work under. Like it. Yeah, under an you know, it, and it's not much different than an ESOP, except an ESOP is just a, a legal term and a structure whereby a whole new entity is created that has the bank borrowing. So, you know, Oak Street would lend to the new entity. The new entity acquires the stock, and this, again, could occur over a period of time, and uh, the debt that is that is put into the new entity to acquire this stock is repaid by earnings from the company. So there's a little bit of complexity both from a legal and an accounting uh, that occurs to set up an ESOP. Um, you know, that's probably one of the drawbacks of this. But again, you know, when you think about the benefits, you've got the autonomy, you've got the same culture because it's the same people that are going to be getting this ownership and you get the business continuity. I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, I've said it before, but I've known some wonderful ESOPs and everybody is on the same team so much. I just I, I just love the ESOP concept. <laughs> Wish I had it. Yeah. Yeah, and that succession loan that we just went through on the previous slide, you know, that's kind of a similar model mm -hmm. to the ESOP. Mm -hmm. Just a little less formal, George. I got you. So uh, I think these were, and you know, more common in the past than they are currently. Me but too. Um, certainly, you know, the alignment of those is nice. Mm -hmm. You know, the management recap is an example uh, on the next slide where you know that succession loan can be utilized, and again, the benefits and the drawbacks are very, very consistent. So it's a mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple transaction. You're just moving the ownership to an existing management team, which, you know, could or could not include family members and, you know, maybe mm -hmm. even uh, a little more diverse. Mm -hmm. The next slide is a, is a real example that we have, and I think these guys are a, a member agency with you, George. Just a wonderful organization yeah, down yeah. in Texas. Yeah. You know, and I'm not going to go through this uh, in specifics, but just at a high level talk to say, you know, there was a majority owner in the business who was really wanted to get out of the business. You had a management team that had been running it for two or three years. And, you know, we were able to provide the funds to buy out the owner, uh, and the stock was reallocated. So, you know, the new owners have an upside in the business. Um, you know, they're not working for, you know, quote, unquote, the man, but they're working for themselves. And what's happened, you know, what typically happens in these ca in these cases is that, you know, that remaining management team is really, you know, liberated and they feel empowered and energized. And what's happened down in this organization is they've just exhibited tremendous growth since this transaction has, uh, has occurred. So, you know, people can go through those slides if you want specifics. Um, 
what I'd like to then now focus on is, you know, preparing to sell. You know, you've heard it before, uh, failing to plan is essentially planning to fail. And, um, you know, it kind of goes to uh, whether you want to sell externally or internally, you know, everybody wants to maximize cash. Um, and the one way to do that is really plan, you know, plan your sale transaction. And, uh, you know, that may not be something that's just going to be able to occur, you know, at the time of the sale. It's going to take a number of years to, uh, you know, to, to put things in place to get your company ready to sell. So what we have here is really, you know, over the next couple of slides is a timeline of things you should focus on, like um, you know, with, within a three-year period, a two-year period, one-year period. And, um, you know, two to three years out, you want to get your house in order. You've heard that probably uh, cliche phrase before, but it's really, you know, assess your, your strengths and weaknesses. And I'm going to tell you, you know, the most important is your management team. Who is going to be there? to drive this business once, you know, an exit occurs. Um, what age are they? How long do they want to be in the business? Do they Are they willing to take risk? Are they not willing to take risk? You know, those things you can really and you should assess uh, now two to three years out before you sell so you can, if it's not the right team, that you can put the right team in place. Hey, Rick, do you, uh, do you excuse yeah. me, do you, do you uh, if people come to you and say, I'd like to sell in two or three years, do you, Structure this for them. Is that part of your we service? We get it all the time. Oh, do you? We, and I was just with a guy in Seattle who, uh, you know, he bought into the business or was offered an opportunity to buy in the business, and he's like, you know what, this isn't something that I, you know, to buy five or ten percent of a business is great and a great opportunity, but ultimately I want to own this agency. How do I? How do I do it? How do I accomplish this? Mm -hmm. And we kind of put a list of things together. You know, it, it's not. A, that's probably a ten-year process. It's a two or three year process uh, mm -hmm. to get ready for the company, you know, to transition the ownership. But over time, it's going to take him ten years to probably gain uh, majority ownership in the business. But it, it's it's great to hear people are thinking about those types of mm -hmm. things, you know, on such a long term approach. So yes, Good. we do we hear it quite often, okay. especially with the demographics that we previously talked about. Right. So. Um, you know, good financial data is always a good thing, you know, and that's really expected in today's market. If you don't have good financial data in place today, you're going to be penalized on a sale price if you don't. So, you know, getting a review, uh, getting a, a compilation in place versus just handing them internal, you know, you're probably going to spend, you know, anywhere from five to $20,000, even 30, depending on the size of the organization to have those, that type of thing done. But you know, you'll get it back in spades when you go to sell this thing in two or three years if you've got audits and good financials and good disclosures of your financials. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, as I said, it's uh, the multiples in the industry are pretty strong. Um, the other thing, don't be afraid too early to start thinking about your advisor team. You know, the uh, having a, a an investment banker now, uh, you shouldn't have to pay for, but you can start evaluating those guys and, and they can help you out with posturing and positioning the company. They can give you an idea today of what the business is worth. Uh, and they should be doing that for free as a way to earn your business. So don't be afraid to, to make those guys work. Um, you've probably had a relationship with a lawyer in the past. Sometimes, sometimes not. They have transactional experience. So you really want to assess you know, a relationship you might have had for 20 years on whether that lawyer has the ability to properly advise you and maximize your structure and dollars that you're putting in your pocket uh, should they have good M&A experience. Mm -hmm. um, a good investment banker will probably minimize the effort you have to make when you're targeting buyers. They're not going to take, you know, a good investment banker is not going to just put together an offering document and send it out to 400 potential buyers. They're going to know based on who you are, what you want to accomplish, the business you're in, you know, they're going to give you 10 potential buyers that they've dealt with before, that they know, you know, the types of assets that they're looking to acquire, and they can accomplish it uh, relatively painlessly. Um, <laughs> You don't want to go out to 400 people, disclose your information. Uh, that that would be very cumbersome. 
Right. Um, and you want to make sure, as I said earlier, that you and your advisors understand the structural components needed for a transaction that you want to accomplish. But here, focusing on the net after-tax dollars is critical. Got it. You know, the timeline that we have on the next slide really uh, talks about, you know, just three years, two years, and one years. But I tell you, the bottom thing, the, the bottom bullet you see on the on the three and the two, focus on your management team. Yeah. Are they locked down with non-competes, non-solicitations? <laughs> Are they going to leave you right before a sale transaction, which is going to potentially queer the deal? Those are key things you want to focus on and understand what your management team and and I probably would put that bullet on the one year before as well, making sure that's aligned. Um, the next slide is just uh, a, a pictorial of those things as well. Um, what drives valuation? Um, two major things here is cash flow in your future cash flow and the probability that you'll be able to you know, achieve those cash flows and your management team as we've discussed. Uh, there's other things in there with just growth trends, consistency, predictability of results, infrastructure, you know, systems and technologies, um, you know, those things can drive valuation. A good, well-run organization will drive a premium over one that is not. Um, understanding valuations, again, I would say the key thing here is uh, finding who the consulting firms and brokers are and the different perspectives that they might have on valuation and what's going to maximize valuation. Targeting a buyer, um, you want to have access to, uh, you know, successful candidates, people that can, um, you know, deliver on what they want. And one thing to be aware of if you're going to sell to a private equity shop is I think because there's so much private equity money out there right now, there's a little bit different bidding process that's occurring, George, with private equity companies. Um, because so many of them are bidding on these, What's occurring now uh, is they'll bid a little bit higher price with the anticipation of you know trying to be able to keep themselves in the bidding process with with then hopefully trying to hammer down on the value uh, as it becomes closer to a sale. So if they identify a weakness in financials or a weakness in your sales strategy or your distribution, they'll try to drive price down. Whereas previously, what they would do is you know, they give you a, a fair estimate with, uh, you know, a 95% probability that they're going to be able to close at the price they're giving you. I would say now those probabilities are a little bit less just because they're trying to stay in the deal and get their money out, but still trying to get an effective, you know, and an efficient transaction done. What's that uh, free service you guys have, Agency Exchange? What is that? Agency Exchange is a website that we have that simply just buys, that lists the agencies. You know, if people want to, hey, I'm looking for an agency in Boise, Idaho, and we want a personal line shop, you can put it on there in the same breath. If you want to buy an agency uh, in Louisiana, we will list the different agencies that are for sale that we know of. So people can buy and sell and transact uh, businesses on there. It's just a, a free exchange to be able mm -hmm. to okay. buy and sell those agencies. I like that. Yeah. And then we also, George, have a person dedicated here at Oak Street to just help people through that process if Great. they need, you know, what's the best way to position or maybe I only want to sell part of my agency, you know, then that's one thing. So, you know, some other examples are, uh, you know, agency equity. You probably have a good relationship with those guys. And then there's just other broker sites that are out there. Yeah. Um, I would be careful with some of those guys, make sure it's a reputable broker. There's some that will just list anything out there, and there's some that will list, uh, you know, brokers that focus in this in this space specifically. You know, Mike Minch, for example, is one that we use out of Florida consistently. Uh, he's in this business. He knows this space very, very well, and he uh, is very knowledgeable and will help. Uh, you know, in a transaction. So that's an example of one. Mm -hmm. Don't want to get into transaction structures too much because there's a lot of different ways to structure these things, George, as you can imagine. Um, th something to consider as well, though, is, uh, you know, what do you want to accomplish? As I started this presentation, what do you want to accomplish at the sale? You want all your cash at closing? Are you willing to take an earnout? 
you know, there's non-competes and employments that you need to consider. Um, if you're a buyer, how do you finance the thing? Is it all senior debt? Is there mezzanine? Or is it all equity? So those are just some considerations uh, to think about as you're, you know, uh, either going into a transaction as a seller or a buyer. Mm -hmm. And we gave some real life examples on the next slide of, you know, different terms and conditions and what each might be looking for with returns, guarantees, uh, the type of security positions, et cetera. Uh, and then a little bit more detail with, you know, on the next slide with SBA lending, straight bank lending, Oak Street, mezzanine financing, and equity. You know, and with that, George, uh, I hope I was able to keep that to 15 minutes or less. <laughs> I don't think so, Sorry. but I tell you what. Yeah. I, you didn't, and I'm glad you didn't because there's too much good stuff here. And, and it's things that people have got to go back to, Rick. they just got to go back to. They can uh, contact you uh, there. Uh, you've got that um, wonderful newsletter that goes out, which I get, and you said there are 25,000 people on that. That's the biggest thing yeah. I'm saying I've heard ever. We've got a distribution of people that have, uh, you know, they want to get the white papers and the case studies that we're putting out there. A lot of times we'll have uh, various vendors that will want to offer a product through there, so we're doing that. Um, you know, sometimes we do it on a, a manual, so people can request manual or an electronic copy. Uh, we do not, you know, we'll do an electronic copy uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, and sometimes even more frequent if we've got some really good content. So it is a great uh, way to stay in touch with what's going on with, you know, a lot of things we talked about today. So they can just call that 317 number there and uh, tell them that they want to, you know, get everything. That you... number is uh, direct to me, and uh -oh. I'd love to hear from anybody. That email will come direct to me. Uh, you know, our website is, uh, you know, oakstreetfunding.com, and they can go to that as well and find it. So whatever is easiest for them. Okay. Love to stay in touch with the people out there in the market. Well, and you've, you've set up, I mean, I, you're the only guy I know that's ever made 2,000 transactions of agency sales. That's got to be a record that will never be broken. But uh, having said that, they uh, uh, people can go back, and I always stress this at the end, go back to roughnotes.com or agencies online, or whatever, and you've got the archive of there. There's going to be, uh, Rick, there's going to be 80 of these by the end of the year. Can you imagine? Just That's amazing. Wonderful. Yeah, George. just it's, it's fun. I'm, I have a great time with it, and I don't, uh, uh, it wasn't hard well, to talk to you. Well, I can tell from your enthusiasm every time I talk to you how much fun you're having. So I really am. I am. I am. I'm, I'm not going to quit for a while until I get old. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Rick, listen, thanks again. We'll let it go at that, and uh, and I'll look forward to talking to you more in the future. And, and, and agents and friends, you can always go back. Once again, and look at this because there's such good stuff. And if you're thinking about selling, now would be the time to get all the information from Rick that you possibly can. So, Rick, again, I thank you. Thank you, George. Take care.